Cap or Superman. Hello and welcome to Junk Ball Media, a video series that's part review, part retrospective, but mostly just stuff. This is a look at Superman's live action appearances. We'll cover the highs and lows since the first time someone donned the blue tights for audiences. We'll focus mainly on the super suit, but if you've seen the Batsuit evolution on Junk Ball Media, you've got an idea of how this will go. So let's get going. This is part one of the Superman evolution. The first actor to don the tights for the public was Ray Middleton for Superman Day at the 1939 World's Fair. There was a comic to coincide with Superman Day. Due to some miscoloring, Superman is rocking red tights and blonde hair for the comic's cover. But for the actual suit worn on Superman's Day, it has all the familiar components of the super suit, with the red trunks, red boots, and cape over blue tights. There were a few unusual modifications. The S shield on the cape was black, similar to the New 52 super suit, but this was 1940, and the cape S shield was typically yellow or yellow and red at this point. The chest S shield was a simple triangle. By summer 1940, the diamond pentagon shape had already appeared in print, but the suit had mostly used the triangle shield since Superman's debut. This S shield uses a red S over black. This was also fairly uncommon at the time. The Max Fleischer cartoons were still over a year away from release at this point, but it bears strong resemblance to this S shield. Finally, the S shield has the name Superman across the top. I guess they didn't want people confusing him with Captain Marvel, not to be confused with Captain Marvel, or 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 Captain, Marvel, or Captain, Marvel, or Captain Howdy. Who's Captain Howdy? Captain Howdy! So anyway, the 1939 World's Fair was featured in Captain America The First Avenger, and I suck at transitions. Carrying on. In 1997, photographs taken around 1940 began circulating of a bodybuilder in a Superman suit. The bodybuilder was named Mayo Khan, and he claimed to be the life model for Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster while they were developing the Superman character. DC Comics denied Khan's claim, and supporting evidence also discredits Khan. First off, it's highly unlikely that Siegel and Shuster, who were struggling artists while developing the Superman character, would spend the time and money to travel to Boston where the photos were taken and to pay a bodybuilder to model for them. Secondly, buildings in the background weren't constructed until after when Khan claims the photos were taken. It's unlikely that Khan was attempting some sort of con, eh? Since he was nearing the end of his life when these photos hit the mainstream. Regardless, he stuck to his claim until his death, and the S-shield from his photos was etched in his gravestone. In 1948, Superman made his live-action screen debut with the Columbia serial Superman. In this incarnation, the super suit was made by Ma Kent from Blankets Baby Kal-El was sent to Earth in. Here's a uniform I made for you out of the blanket you were wrapped in when we found you. It's a strange kind of cloth that resists both fire and acid. I hope it'll protect you all. Well, thank you, Mother. This is consistent with the comics where the earliest explanation of the super suit's origin appeared in January 1945. That issue explained that the S-Shield was designed by Clark Kent as a child. The S not only stood for Superboy, but for saving lives, stopping crime, but also for cheese. <laughs> Wait, no, that doesn't start with S. This was the 1940s, and spandex was still decades away. So this super suit was likely some sort of cotton wool blend that more resembles a sweater. Notice these thick cuffs. The cape is the same pleated look as the comics, but it's clearly sewn onto the shirt instead of tucked into the neckline. It was also prone to hitting him in the face. But again, this was the 1940s, and a lot of this serial was awkward. Typical woman driver. The S shield is a familiar variant from what was used in the comics, down to the serif on the S. The rest of the costume is also faithful to the comics, with the oval belt buckle and the S shield on the cape. The same suit was reused in the 1950s serial Adam Man vs. Superman, which also featured Wally West, aka Flash No. 3, playing a door? Anyway, both the 1948 and 1950 serials were produced by Sam Katzman, 
who also produced the 1949 Batman and Robin serial. Luther's machine was a reuse of the Wizard's machine from that serial. Kirk Allen, the actor who portrayed Superman, was approached to star in the Superman TV show, but declined. Looking ahead to the flying harness slash torture device that was used to film the flying special effects shots in that TV show, it was probably a good idea. He would later appear alongside the first Lois Lane, Noel Neal, as parents to 1978's Lois Lane. And he'll always be remembered for the actor to give Superman crazy eyes. Oh my god. What happened to your eyes? Where am I going? You won't need eyes to see. A redesigned supersuit debuted with George Reeves in the 1951 movie, Superman and the Mole Men, which served as a pilot of sorts for the Adventures of Superman TV series. Initially, Reeves wore the same chest S-shield as Kirk Allen. Both suits were made by the Western Costume Company, and apparently they still make a Superman suit. But Reeves's S-shield design would evolve over the course of the series' run. By the final season, the S-shield was framed with straighter lines and used bulkier material. Speaking of bulk, the costume designers also kept adding padding under the supersuit. It was already apparent in the first 1951 supersuit, and absolutely ridiculous by the final Reeves supersuit in 1958. The most drastic update to the Reeves supersuit was the cape. It narrowly attaches at the neckline and drapes drastically down the back. It started off draping just a few inches in the 1951 supersuit, but by the end of the series' run, it hung nearly to his lower back. In the real world, the suit was shades of brown and gray while the show was still shot on black and white film. But there was a white variation of the supersuit when Superman was frozen. Just like the 1948 supersuit, Reeves' supersuit was made by Ma Kent from the acid proof and fireproof blankets he was sent to Earth with. It's made out of the red and blue blanket she was wrapped in the day your paw and me. I know, Ma. He took his supersuit very seriously, too because in the episode, The Stolen Costume, where the supersuit was stolen, Superman ends up leaving the criminals at fault stranded on top of a mountain, where they fall to their deaths. <coughs> Immediately following the cancellation of The Adventures of Superman, a pilot was filmed for a spin-off series, The Adventures of Superpup. This supersuit featured an S-Shield inspired by Reeves's S-Shield, white gloves inspired by Mickey Mouse, and a dog mask inspired by your worst nightmares. Super Pup was portrayed by Billy Curtis, who also played a mole man alongside George Reeves. Super Pup's alter ego is Bark Bent, who writes for the Daily Bugle. This is still four years before the Daily Bugle would first appear with the Fantastic Four in January 1962, and later as the paper that Peter Parker writes for. Oh, the crossover possibility. Nightmare. Another unsuccessful pilot was produced in 1961, The Adventures of Superboy. This supersuit is a further evolution of Reeves' supersuit. The cape doesn't drape as low anymore, and the cape tucks into the back of the neck, instead of the shoulders. This Superboy has the usual superpowers. At one point, Superboy crushes some coal to create diamonds, just like in Superman 3. In this iteration of Superboy, the police summon him by using a hotline that causes a lamp to dim in his front room. Superboy also has a secret cave beneath the Kent farm, because every teen goes to a dark place at some point. The supersuit next appeared on stage in the musical It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman. Despite being a campy stage musical, this is the most refined iteration of the supersuit yet. It briefly appeared on screen in this aftershave commercial, also featuring the original production actor, Bob Holliday. This supersuit would only be used for about three months before the production closed, but a handful of revivals have since been produced, featuring their own versions of the supersuit. Perhaps the most viewed version of the musical supersuit is the 1975 made-for-TV version starring David Wilson. My freaky x-ray vision. It's awful. It makes Superman 4 look like the Tree of Life. The fight dance musical numbers look unrehearsed. The onomatopoeia sound effect graphics are cheap, even for the time. And Superman looks like some substitute teacher that just rolled out of bed. The super suit looks intentionally bad too, with this disproportionate S-shield and extremely wide neckline. 
One thing of note is that Lois Lane is portrayed by Leslie Ann Warren. Oh, Superman, you're wonderful! Who later auditioned for Lois Lane in the 1978 movie. She also screen tested with Christopher Reeve. Well, to put it delicately, do you eat? This musical was rushed through production so it could be released, narrowly missing the Salkinds taking over the screen rights to Superman. It manages to be the worst DC Comics live action adaptation, beating out even Legends of the Superheroes and Catwoman and Man of Steel. So that wraps up part one of the series. Check out part two where we'll hit up the next several iterations of the Super Suit. If you want to stay in the loop for when the next parts of the series are released, feel free to subscribe or follow on Twitter or like on Facebook for whatever your internet mode of consumption fancies. Help me. I'll catch you in the next video and as always, thanks for watching you spineless jellyfish. You haven't the spine of a jellyfish. You saved me from a smash up Superman. You can thank Clark Kent.